As Josh said, my name is Rick Cerns, and I'm the new director of the Washington um, SAGE organization. It's a volunteer position. Uh, my wife's also here with me. They do have a part-time secretary position that goes with it. You may have seen uh, some pictures in the lobby or uh, remember from Josh's comments earlier, but I was just curious. I bet a lot of you have never heard of SAGE. But before today, how many of you have heard of Washington SAGE? Yeah, more than I thought. Good. I'm going to talk about SAGE today, but I'm going to primarily um, shift that to a little bit later in the sermon. Um, I wanted to tell you, I'm not a pastor. Um, I was a teacher and school administrator for my whole life, but um, I remembered something that HMS Richards Sr. said. Some of you are a bit older like me, may remember HMS Richards Sr. was the one who started the Adventist uh, Broadcast Ministry Voice of Prophecy. And he said about homiletics, which is the art of preaching, he said, you just need to remember three things. First, you tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them, and then you to tell them what you told them. So I'm going to follow that. I'm going to start out by telling you what I'm going to tell you. Um, the, we're going to divide up the uh, service in kind of different segments here. We're going to have actually a couple of stories um, that are embedded in here. Your pastor told me that you love to learn from stories, and I'm glad I do too. That's my favorite way of learning. So in addition to the children's stories, you're going to have two other stories. And um, after, after the first story, then um, I'm going to tell you more about SAGE and, and why I'm, I'm visiting churches and how you can become involved with SAGE. But the first part of our service here is the SIVA flood story. And I'm, in a moment, I'm going to ask my wife to come up and read it. And I have a confession to make. This is absolutely far and away my favorite mission story ever. I've read it a dozen times. I've even tried reading it up front. But every time I read it, I can't help but cry. It is so touching. So that's why my wife's reading it today. <laughs> so come on up. Not to say that I might not be a little bit weak. In 1921, a missionary couple named David and, and uh, Svi Flood went with their two-year-old son, David, from Sweden to the heart of, A of Africa to what was then known as the Belgian Congo. They met up with another young Scandinavian couple, the Eriksons, and the four of them sought God for direction in those days much, with much tenderness and devotion and sacrifice. They felt led by the Lord to go out from their main mission and station and take the gospel to a very remote area. This was a huge step of faith. At the remote village of Nadal, Nadalara, they were rebuffed by the chief, who would not let them enter even into the village for fear of alienating the local gods. The two couples opted to go half a mile up the slope and to build themselves a little mud hut. They prayed for spiritual breakthrough, but there was none. There was only contact with the villagers, the only contact with the villagers was a young, a little boy who was allowed to sell them chickens and eggs just twice a week. Sevilla Flood, a tiny woman missionary, only four feet eight inches tall, decided that if this was the only African that she could talk to, she would try to lead this little boy to Jesus. And in fact, after many weeks of loving and witnessing to him, she trusted Christ. He trusted Christ as his savior, but there were no other encouragements. Meanwhile, malaria continued to strike one of the members of the little band after another. And in time, the Ericsons decided they just had to enough suffering and they left to return to the central missions uh, station. But David and Suvi Flood remained near Nadolara to go on alone. Then all of the things. Sevilla found herself pr pregnant in the middle of the primitive wilderness. And when the time came for her to give birth, that was 1923, 20, so it's a ways back, the village chief softened enough to allow a midwife to come help her. A little girl was born to whom they named um, Aenea. 
The delivery, however, was exhausting, and Sevilla flood was already weak from bouts of malaria. The birth process was a heavy blow to her stamina, and after 17 desperate days of prayer and struggle, she died. Inside, David fled, something snapped in that very moment. His heart full of bitterness, he dug a crude grave, buried his 27-year-old wife, and took his children back down the mountain to the mission station, giving this newborn daughter to the Ericsons. He said, I'm going back to Sweden. I have lost my wife, and I can't take care of this baby. God has ruined my life. With two-year-old David, he headed for the coast, rejecting the only his calling, but not only his calling, but God himself. Within eight months, both the Ericsons were stricken with this mysterious illness. Some believe they were poisoned, maybe by the local chief who hated the missionaries, and died within days of each other. The nine-month-old baby, Aina, was given to an American missionary couple named Berg, to, who adjusted her Swedish name to Aggie and eventually brought her back to the United States at age three. The Bergs lived, loved little Aggie, but were afraid that if they tried to return to Africa, some of the legal ob obstacles might separate her from them since they had, at that time, not been given legal adoption. So they decided to stay in the United States and switch from missionary work to pastoral ministry. And that is how Aggie grew up in South Dakota. As a young woman, she attended North Central Bible College in, in Minneapolis. And there she met a, a married a young preacher named Dewey Hurst. Years passed. The Hursts enjoyed a fruitful ministry. Aggie gave birth first to a daughter, then to a son. And in time, her husband became president of the Christian College in the Seattle area, and some of you may know this college, Northwest Christian College in Kirkland. It's a few miles from the Puget Sound Adventist uh, Academy. And Aggie was in, in, intrigued to find so much Scandinavian heritage there. One day, around 1963, a Swedish religious magazine appeared in her mailbox. She had no idea who had sent it, and of course, she couldn't read the words. But as she turned the pages, all of a sudden, a photo popped and just stopped her cold. There, in a primitive setting, in the heart of Africa, was a grave with a white cross. And on the cross was her mother's name, Sevilla Flood. Aggie jumped into her car, drove straight to the college faculty member who she knew would, could translate the article. And what does it say, she says, please. The instructor translated the story. He said it tells about missionaries who went to Madalari in the heart of the Belgian Congo in 1921. The birth of a little white girl, the death of a young missionary mother, and one little African boy who had been led to Christ. And how after all the whites had left, this little African boy grew up and persuaded the chief to let him build a school in the village. The article told how gradually the now grown-up boy won all of the students to Christ. The children led their parents to Christ. Even the chief became a Christian. Today, in 1963 this was, there were 600 Christian believers in that little village. Because of the willingness of David and Sivita Flood, Siva Flood to answer God's call to Africa because they endured so much, but were still faithful to witness and lead one little boy, just one, to trust Jesus, God had saved at that point 600 people. At the time Siva Flood died, it appeared to human reason that God had led the young couple to Africa only to desert them in their time of desperate and deepest need. It would be 40 years before God's amazing grace and his real plan for the village of Nadalara was to be known. 
For, Red, for Rev, uh, Dewey, Reverend Judy, Angie Hearst's 25th wedding anniversary, the college presented them with a gift of a vacation to Sweden. There, Aggie met her biological father. An old man now, David Flood, had remarried, fathered four more children, and, gen, and generally dis, uh, dissipated his life with alcohol. He had recently suffered a stroke and still bitter, he had one rule in his family, never mention the name of Jesus or God, that, because God took my everything from me. After an emotional reunion with her half-brothers and half-sister, Aggie brought up the subject of seeing her father. The others hesitated. Uh, you can't talk to him, they replied, and it, even if he, even though he is very ill now, you need to know that whatever he hear, whenever he hears the name of God, he flies into a rage. Angie could not be deterred. She walked into the squalid apartment with liquor bottles everywhere, and she approached the 73-year-old man lying in a rumpled bed. Papa, she said tentatively. He turned and began to cry. I, Aina, he said, I never meant to give you away. It's all right, Papa, she replied, taking him gently in her arms. God took care of me. Then the man instantly stiffened. The tears stopped. God forgot all of us. Our lives have been like this because of him. And then he turned his face to the wall. Eggie stroked his face and continued undaunted. Papa, I've got a little story that I must tell you, and it's a true one. You didn't go to Africa in vain, and Mama didn't die in vain. The little boy that you both won to the Lord grew up to win the whole village to Jesus. And one seed you planted just kept growing and growing. There are 600 African people serving the Lord because you and Mama were faithful to, call, to the call of God. Jesus loves you. He never, ever left or hated you. The old man turned back to look at his daughter's eyes. His body relaxed. He began to talk. And at the end of the afternoon, he had come to God and he had repented of many decades. Over the next few days, father and daughter enjoyed warm moments together. Eggie and her husband soon had to return to America. And within weeks, David Flood died. A few years later, the Hearst were attending a high-level evangelistic conference in London, England, where a report was given from the nation of Zaire, the former Belgian Congo. The superintendent of the national church represented some 110,000 baptized members who spoke eloquently of the gospel and spread in his nation. Aggie could not help going up afterward to ask him if he had ever heard of David and Svi Flood. I'm their daughter, she said. And the man began to weep. Yes, madame, the man replied in French, his words then being translated into English. It was Svi Flood who led me to Jesus. I was the boy who brought food to your parents before you were born. In fact, to this day, your mother's grave and her memory are honored by all of us. He embraced her in long, sobbing hug, and then he continued, You must come to Africa and see, because your mother is the most famous person in our, in our history, in our town. In time, that is exactly what Agahurst did and her husband. They were welcomed by cheering throngs of villagers, even met the man who so many years before, when she was less than a month old, had been hired by her father to carry her down the mountain in a soft bark hammock. The most dramatic moment, of course, is when the pastor escorted Eggie to see her mother's grave, marked with a white cross for herself. She knelt in the soil of Africa, the place of her birth, to praise and pray and give thanks. Later that day, in the church service, the pastor prayed, read from John 12, 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. 
But if it dies, it produces many, many seeds. He then followed with Psalms 126.5, They who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Don't take my sermon notes. <laughs> Isn't that great? I, uh, like I said, I get emotional every time I read or hear that story. I, I think it's be, there's three different par- points in the story. One, of course, is is when um, she finds out that the whole village is is converted, and two, when her father's reconverted, and and three, when she goes back to the village, he not only converted the village, he became a leader of 110,000 uh, um, people in that. Um, denomination. Um, I, I, you can see from that why I chose the, the title for the sermon, You Are a Mustard Seed. I don't, I want to talk about sage today, but I don't want any of you to think that anything you do for God is small. Um, I don't care what age you are or uh, whether you go overseas as a missionary or whether you, you talk to your next door neighbor. There's a, if you're committed to spreading God's gospel, it's, it's going to happen, and it's going to blossom. And I, I love the saying that St. Francis Assisi said, we need to preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. And he, um, the, I, I think the reason I get emotional in stories like that, I think about in heaven someday when people see the fruits of what they did or the prayers that they prayed. So never stop praying for your loved ones and never think anything is too small. Um, I chose First Peter 4.10. Um, for for the um, uh, scripture reading, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, which ties in, excuse me, with sage and uh, and the rest of the sermon. But it also, I also wanted to reference uh, Matthew thirteen thirty two, and I'm not going to take the time to turn there and read it. But that's the story about the mustard seed, where Jesus said about the gospel, the mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds there is, but it's when it's planted in the ground, when it's nourished. It sprouts up to be one of the biggest things, and that's that was certainly illustrated in, in the story that we just heard. Um, so let me transition to talking about sage. Um, a lot of you know what sage is, but during COVID, of course, a lot of activities didn't happen so much. And uh, Bob Grady is um, has been the director of Sage forever. Um, Bob turned 91 this year. He's still very active, but he decided to step down about a year ago. And um, and they finally asked me, after asking several other people, I think, <laughs> if I would do it. And I uh, we prayed about it and decided to step in and do it, even though we haven't been involved in Sage. So we're going to learn together. Um, it... Uh, Started in 1994, SAGE stands for Seniors in Action for God with Excellence. But again, this sermon's not just for seniors, but I am going to tell you about SAGE. But you can be involved in uh, Maranatha mission trips or in SAGE uh, mission trips even, or certainly in a number of other activities in your daily lives like we just talked about, regardless of what age you are. But SAGE started in 1994. It's for anybody who's over 50, kind of like AARP. Um, I realize that a lot of people that are still working, um, it's difficult to get off to go on a mission trip or to get off for an extended period of time to help in projects like the we, we do. But um, we do a lot of other things that are just on the weekend or, or just for fun, too. So SAGE includes an international mission trip in a partnership with, um, with Maranatha. Um, if, how many of you heard of Maranatha? Are you familiar with Maranatha Ministries? That's a wonderful organization. It actually started just a few years before SAGE. I think it was 1989. And they're um, not an, a direct um, or department of this church, but they work in cooperation with the church. And they do hundreds of missionary uh, uh, mission trips throughout the world. And, and um, we're going to see a, a little bit of clip of some of the work that they've done. But one of the things I'm really excited about that they're doing is just last year, um, they put in s- over 600 new wells throughout the world. And I think a- apart from spreading the gospel, the greatest need in the world is for clean water. So I'm really excited about Maranatha doing that. But they build churches, they build schools, they do all sorts of things. Um, and then um, 
SAGE does an international mission trip a year. I can't remember, did I just mention they've done a total of 23 in the last 29 years in 15 different countries. Um, the next one, we usually try to plan out about a year in advance, so the next one we're tentatively planning on going to the Dominican Republic in January or February of next year. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that work in the Dominican Republic in two coming up. Um, but in addition to the international trip, there's local similar activities like helping Sunset Lake get ready for camps or doing some work at Rosario Beach. I was looking through, um, excuse me, do you have a tissue? Um, okay. I'm not, not because I'm still emotional, but I've been fighting a little bit of a cold too. So <laughs> excuse me for that. Um, it, I, I noticed um, um, Sage put out a 25th anniversary celebration in 2019. And, um, and, and we have a booklet some of you can look at. I'll bring it to Potluck if you want to look through it. And it tells about the activities that Sage did for each of the years. And I noticed in there in 2004, it said that they helped with the Polesville School. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. Excuse me. So and some of you may remember that. I was talking to someone in the hall. They said that the uh, SAGE came out several different times and helped with the construction of the school. So that's some of the type of thing that SAGE does too locally in, in the, like I mentioned, Rosero Beach. Some, some with local denominations in, in uh, Washington Conference. They also helped with a, um, there's a kind of a museum of Adventist history back in Michigan that you, some of you may remember Elder Jakes was a pra conference president here. He had out, led out in reconstructing that, and uh, Sage helped out in that. Sage helped out in pictures you can see on the, on the tripod with Holbrook um, Mission School, which is down in Arizona. So there's a lot of different activities locally and around the world that Sage has been helping out in. We have one gentleman who's 85 years old. And he's, he's a professional painter, and he's still going with Sage trips, and he's been instrumental in this. They said uh, Sage has painted over 200 buildings in the last 30 years. So, um, but I do want to tell you, you don't have to... Oh, I, I did want to put in a little, um, I guess, joke here. One thing I don't like about the story that Valerie read, it talks about Aunt Aggie, Aggie, is that going back to see her father when he was an old man? He said he was 73. I mean, I'm 72. <laughs> so, I, of course, I haven't been an alcoholic my whole life. That probably makes a difference. But um, you may be active. You may be able to do um, construction projects and paint. And you may want to do that after you retire, clear up into your 80s. Um, but if you're not able to do that or not, that's not your calling, uh, you can still go on an international trip or, or these other trips. Um, some of the other things they do on the international trips is vacation Bible schools. There's a lady over in, she lives in Walla Walla now, used to live in Washington Conference, who helps out with that and kind of is the guru. She used to be a teacher. Um, you can also help out with, sometimes we take a doctor or dentist along and do um, medical missionary work while we're there. The, the um, trips usually last about 10 days. Also, one other thing I was going to mention, sometimes a, a pastor comes along and work with a lo local minister and do evangelistic meetings. So there's a lot of ways you can help out even on a mission trip without necessarily feeling like you need to be a builder and carry bricks. But there's plenty of opportunity to do that too if you're up to that. And, and one thing Bob Grady said to me and Valerie, he said, make everything fun. Whether you're working whether you're doing a social outreach with uh, activity, sometimes they go to a Mariners game together or whatever, it always needs to be fun, and, and that's what we want to continue. Uh, Bob, Bob did a great job in leadership for the last 20, 27 years. Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought, and I was just transition, transitioning into uh, um, was something about the uh, various activities that you can get in involved in. Maybe I'll come back to it. But um, any anybody can be part of SAGE. If you're over 50, just give us your email. There's no membership dues. Anybody's part of SAGE. Even if you're not yet 50 and you want to receive our newsletters, you're welcome to um, give us your email and you can get on the list. And I like the part about fun. 
I think that um, there's a saying that I, I think Bob told us too. It's um, there's the the do. Oh, he said there's three people that get involved in the sage: the go goes, the slow goes, and the no goes. <laughs> And so, so there's something for everybody. There's there. something for everybody, yeah. And a gift too is um, is hospitality, is social, is the social end of, of sage. And I know that my husband is kind of on the mission side, but I kind of feel real strong about the fact that we all need each other, and we need something to look forward to, and we need to use the gifts that we have in hospitality. So just had to add that before. One of the values of SAGE and important contributions I think it makes, um, some of you may be able to relate this to, your, to relate to this yourself or somebody else you know. When you go into retirement, I think this particular happens to men maybe more than women, but it can happen to anybody, and it can happen before retirement too, of course. But sometimes when you stop working, you feel like you're no longer needed, and you feel like um, you're, you're no longer useful. And maybe your sphere of, of people that you contact in, on a daily basis, you don't contact anymore, and there's loneliness that sets in. Loneliness is an epidemic for every age um, in our society today, with people, and COVID certainly didn't help, people being isolated, but young people being spending all their time on, on social media and not interacting directly with one another. So for SAGE, and people get involved in that, it's a tremendous way to build friendships and camaraderie and to feel useful. And if you're not yet of sage age, um, we are certainly open to a sage member inviting a child or grandchild to come with them and be a mentor. And there's in the Maranatha uh, mission trips, of course, can be any age, and they do family trips and so forth, too. I did remember the thing I was trying to forget of. It was just silly, the rest of the joke. Some of you can relate to this. It says, uh, somebody said, isn't it weird to be the same age as old people? When you grow older, you realize all of a sudden, wow, you know, I don't feel old, but I guess I am 72. But we can still be active and involved. So before I go on to a little bit more about the um, local activities and social activities, I have a couple clips, three clips of just a few seconds each or a minute or two each that I'm going to ask to... Uh, gentlemen upstairs to show you. And the first one is about Maranatha trips in general. And then it transitions to, they have these videos called Maranatha Minutes, where they just tell something Maranatha is doing for one minute. And one of them was about sage. I thought you'd like to hear that. And there's another one that was actually 22 minutes long that they actually made just about sage in 2017. But we're only, only, only going to watch the first minute and a half of that one. But we'll go ahead and, and roll those. Well, that's spinning. I'll talk for a couple minutes. Sometimes my new beginnings. Too. And yet, at the same time, the end of a year calls on us to look back at what the past 12 months have brought us and what we have given back. For Maranatha Volunteers International, 2023 has been a year of growth. After a few years of lighter involvement due to the pandemic, we have been seeing a steady climb in volunteerism. In 2023, Maranatha mobilized more than 2,500 volunteers to seven countries around the world. Thanks to your donations and your service, we will reach our goal to build 400 churches, work on 10 school campuses, drill at 680 locations, and make maintenance and repairs on hundreds of wells. 
On today's episode of Maranatha Mission Stories, we take a look at what you've helped us to accomplish, where we still need help, and where we're headed next. First, we start in the Dominican Republic, a place where Maranatha has held five different efforts. Our most recent effort started in 2022 with the goal to build 30 Maranatha churches, a large school, and some water wells. And in 2023, the work really took off. This year, we've hosted about 17 groups. About 850 volunteers will uh, work in the Dominican Republic this year. And roughly about 10 churches will be finished by the end of this year. Volunteers, many of them from school and church youth groups, came from all over the world to serve in multiple capacities. Most helped on church construction projects. Groups also organized outreach projects, such as Vacation Bible School, eye clinics, and medical clinics. Beyond the churches, volunteers also started on an expansive school campus. Ciudad del Cielo is a neighborhood located in the northern part of Santo Domingo. There are about 87 churches in this area, but not a single Adventist school. Church leadership asked Maranatha if we would help to provide a campus to serve the large area. Maranatha developed a plan for a school that will include... If, uh, while they're switching to the next one, I'll just make a quick comment. Um, well, it's already ready. Hi, I'm Dustin Kahn with the Maranatha Minute. Volunteers from the SAGE Ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Washington State recently served in Kenya. SAGE stands for Seniors in Action for God with Excellence, which is a ministry for ages 50 and above. On this trip, 24 SAGE volunteers constructed a new dean's house for the Kajiado Adventist School and Rescue Center. Besides laying block walls, volunteers facilitated a medical clinic for nearly 900 patients. Other volunteers put on children's ministry programs in several villages. The group also held an evangelistic campaign with nearly 700 total attendees, leading to 84 baptisms. At the end of their project, volunteers joined a special dedication ceremony for the new Dean's House at Caggiato. To start serving on Maranatha projects yourself, be sure to visit our website at maranatha.org slash volunteer. Experiencing the joy that comes from new friendships. Seeing children move from leaky, drafty classrooms to sturdy, weather-protected buildings. Witnessing the transformation of a faith community as they move from sanctuaries under trees to true houses of worship, all with the powerful force of volunteer labor. It's no wonder that daily, groups of people call Maranatha Volunteers International, seeking a place in the world where they can make a difference. Maranatha works carefully to place church groups, academy groups, and even family groups in places where their desire to serve meets the community's needs. One of the groups that calls Maranatha every year is made up of primarily retired people in the state of Washington. The group is known as SAGE, Seniors in Action for God with Excellence. A group of 34 SAGE members were just about to leave for India when we went to the Great Northwest in the middle of a very cold winter. 
If you want to see the rest of that video, it's 22 minutes long or so, or any of the others, if you want something exciting or inspirational to do on Sabbath afternoon or Friday evening, you can find dozens of these Maranatha videos just online just by Googling Maranatha uh, Volunteers International or, you know, it's, it, they're all on, um, on um, YouTube and, and they've got a whole, bunch, a whole library of videos. It's really fun to watch them. I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of that and I'm going to transition now to some of the local projects and I know I'm just about out of time, but... Um, there's a gentleman, some of you may know, Lowell Dunstan. He was our teacher and principal in the Adventist system here in Washington for many years. He, uh, he was up in the Cypress School in um, North Seattle for quite a while, and he tells this story. He's actually written a book, and this is part of the book, and he, uh, you may want to purchase it when it comes out, but it's called The Cypress Paint Party. He said, being a painting contractor was not on my resume, but that became my role the summer of 2007. The Cypress SDA school board had discussed the need to repaint the school exterior for some time, but how to find the personnel and how to pay for repainting the four large buildings were unanswered questions. The project was launched unexpectedly by a phone call from a Cypress board member who had been a translator for SAGE projects in Spanish-speaking countries. She said, Lowell, a SAGE project just fell through. If you can act fast and we can be ready in three weeks, I can have at least 25 people to help paint Cypress School. They were looking for another project close to home. Word spread quickly, and the manager of the Auburn Academy Warehouses at that time, Roger Ferris, called and said, I hear that Sage may paint Cypress School. Don't spend a penny on paint. We need to remove a whole warehouse full of paint because of a client no longer needing it. How soon can you come and get it? So um, the teacher's name was Rick Roberts. He went down with Lowell. Um, and he, Rick had actually been a painting contractor himself at one point or had done some painting. And so they arrived and we climbed over many skids of paint, finally finding many five-gallon paints of sage green and more of tan. The combination of colors would be a great uh, earth tones for our building. But there were more hurdles to conquer. However, there are more turtles to conquer, however. The tilted up white rock walls of our building were covered with years of dust. For paint to stick, the walls must be power washed and dry for a few days. A man who was only in town temporarily called and said, I'm a retired school board chair and I know how hard it is to get volunteers. Would it help if I came next week with my power washer? Then a mother called and said, could I send my two boys to help you next week? I quickly agreed knowing that they were two great dependable boys and we were able to borrow another power washer and our volunteer and I powered washed from ladders while the boys power washed from the ground. All the walls got washed and had the weekend to dry before the Monday painting crew was to begin. Another detail remained. What about all the equipment and we would, that we would need for volunteers? A contractor in one of our constituent churches called offering to prepare the needed list and to take me around to paint stores on Friday to accomplish this much needed task. We had, an, we had Sunday left to lay everything out on the gym floor and get organized. And um, Rick Roberts, our teacher, had been a former painter, took care of this and another important detail, different paints had to be used for the metal doors and frames. One final detail was answered by the ladies of the Cypress staff who took care of providing breakfast and lunch for the needed, for the, for, that was needed for the volunteers each day. When I first got the call about the opportunities, my thought was, would it be foolish to take on such a huge project with such short notice? But I remembered several examples in the Bible where people stepped out in faith without knowing how God would work on their behalf. For the Israelites in the time of Moses, um, they had to step in, into the Red Sea. And the priest had to first take a step into the water before it parted. A second generation of Israelites in the time of Joshua had to do the same thing when faced with the crossing, crossing the, the Jordan River at flood stage. Sometimes we need to step out but we need to risk putting our foot in the water and God will provide the rest. Hindsight often shows that before we even knew what to ask for, God had all the answers ready ahead of time. God impressed people to call us with the ready-made solutions for every piece of paint party puzzle, of the puzzle, even the perfect timing sequence of every needed process on the, in the right order. 
When Monday morning dawned, 35 SAGE volunteers showed up, including a professional painter with his spray painting equipment, and we were able to get started. The team of SAGE volunteers was fast, efficient, and confident, and they had fun doing the work. Because of God leading at every step, we were able to finish our gigantic project and paint all four buildings in just one week. Friday, as I reviewed how all the pieces of the Cypress Paint Party puzzle fit together, I was amazed. Once again, I was reminded that with God, all things are possible. The impossible can become possible. But for miracles to happen, we must be willing to put our feet in the water. So I could go on and on with Sage stories, but that's, that's essentially Sage. And again, I want to say, um, you don't have to be buff and ready to lay bricks in order to go on a Sage mission trip. But if you're able to do that type of work at all, there's different activities that people can do depending on their physical condition. I have to tell you one quick story that um, Bob told us. He said, when Sage first started doing this, people thought, oh, that's just for old people. And they even went on one of the, old, uh, one of the international trips and some of the young men in the village kind of stood around snickering at these older people trying to build this uh, structure. And the first day, he said they put up f uh, four rows of bricks all around the building. And by the end of the week, they had the entire building finished. And they said Sage was more efficient and productive than any group they'd had. So you're not too old. Don't sit in the rocking chair. Don't play golf. Come and be part of Sage. A couple more things we alluded to earlier. SAGE is not just for building projects. It's for social outreach and for spiritual outreach. In the past, um, SAGE has actually had some, <clears throat> some retreats up at Hope, British Columbia, kind of mini camp meetings. And we'd like to um, <clears throat> some start some of that up again, if not this summer, the following summer, and some uh, shorter weekend spiritual retreats. Um, sometimes they do some just fun activities like parties or potlucks. And sometimes they go to a Mariner game or something like that. So, again, um, both in the hall when you go out and also at the potluck, we've got some opportunities for you to simply give us your email and you're automatically a member of SAGE or we'll start getting information about it. So, I told you what I was going to tell you and I told you and I think we're done. I'm, we're going around um, trying to just raise awareness and inter interest in SAGE. If you know anybody who's not here today and would be interested in that, please have them get in touch to, um, as well. And um, remember the, the story that you heard about Siva Flood. Remember all the uh, work that's been done by Maranatha. And remember, you are a mustard seed. Okay, our closing hymn, I think, well, the ladies will come up and lead out. It's um, in your hymn number five or 316.